and Education International, also the Ontario Federation of Labour and the Canadian Labour Congress. As a teacher, I am really looking forward to the upcoming panel that will explore the impact that the erosion of our democratic institutions is having here in Canada and abroad. In our classrooms, we teach students about the important role that science, verifiable data and critical analysis play in decision making and in developing effective public policy. So to watch as these fundamental principles are being eroded is of grave concern to me and I suspect to all of you. I cannot think of anyone better suited to moderate this session than Susan Delacorte. Susan is the Toronto Star's senior writer in Ottawa and has covered federal politics for more than two decades as a reporter and bureau chief. She was the winner of the 2011 Charles Lynch Award, an annual award presented to a Canadian journalist in recognition of outstanding coverage of national issues as selected by their colleagues in the Canadian Parliamentary Press Gallery. Susan has authored four books on Canadian politics, including her most recent, Shopping for Votes, How Politicians Choose Us and We Choose Them. Shopping for Votes was shortlisted a shortlisted nominee for the 2014 Hillary Weston Writers Trust Prize for Nonfiction. Please join me in welcoming Susan Delacourt. Thank you. So do we, do we start? <laughs> okay. I was just waiting for everybody to calm down. All right, the uh, title of this panel is The Great Unraveling, Why It Matters, That Conservatives Have Made Canada Less Democratic. And before I say a few things, I think I'll introduce the four distinguished people who are gonna be talking about this, just so um, you know what we're getting into. Uh, go in order of, uh, from my right. Mark Burry holds a doctorate in history and masters in journalism. He has spent most of his working life as an independent journalist, writing hundreds of articles for the Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, the National Post, and many of this country's magazines. Uh, he's now studying law at the <clears throat> University of Ottawa because he's a glutton for punishment, I think. <laughs> And Kill the Messenger is an excellent book. I, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Uh, is his 11th book. And his next book, The Killing Game, is on ISIS recruitment in Canada and will be published next April by HarperCollins. Michael Harris, also another distinguished author, is a columnist at large. I love that title. He re I, I think he's a guy who lives up to the title. He is a columnist at large with iPolitics and an author who has spent his career trying to correct injustices uh, from the Mount Cashel abuses, the wrongful conviction of Donald Marshall, to an inquiry all on its own on federal penitentiaries. And the reason he's here today, and the focus of his interest, as any of you who've read him will know, uh, Party of One, the leadership style of Stephen Harper's government. Uh, Kelly, oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you much. I'm gonna clap for everybody. Uh, Frederick Merin is a specialist in European politics and the sociology of international relations. He's a former foreign policy advisor, and uh, former prof and he's visiting professor at University of Toronto, Strasbourg, Toulouse, Lille, and in Rome. Um, his focus, uh, part of his research does focus on the decline of great powers as well, and he'll be talking to us about the putting things into a global context. <clears throat> And Kelly Carmichael is the Executive Director of Fair Vote Canada, a former chair of the East Toronto, De Toronto Community Coalition. She ran the No Big Box campaign in Toronto, and she is now a part-time organic farmer near Peterborough and an activist. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just going to make a few remarks and then we're going to hopefully have, uh, we're all going to stay within our five minutes, aren't we? Uh, 
so that we can get lots of questions and discussion from the floor because I think a conversation on democracy should include a lot of back and forth. Sure. Um, just to set it up though, it's hard to find anyone in Canada who has good things to say about how politics is conducted these days. The Samara organization just this week released a dismal report card followed by a 90 minute online debate, I don't know if any of you caught it, it was depressing <coughs> watching, which found that politics is almost irredeemably broken in Canada. So that's the glass half empty part. Um, there is a glass half full part though and it comes in the form of the study that was released uh, yesterday, I guess, David McGrain's study that show that people still believe in the idea of government as a force for good. And even at the Manning Institute, which is sort of the, the uh, mirror image conference, when they released a poll, it showed that people's, the, the biggest attribute that people wanted in their politicians was not expertise or pocketbook issues. People <coughs> wanted ethics and integrity in government. Those two surveys, and the fact that, that people care enough about politics, I think is the glass half full part. There is still a hope and a yearning for politics and government to be better. Yesterday at the session on framing, we heard Tim Powers say that progressives have actually helped Stephen Harper by casting him in such an unrelenting, dastardly light. All Harper has to do is be a little less dastardly or not quite Satan himself, Powers said, and most Canadians even grudgingly will say, well, he's not that bad. And it's true, just to bring it down a little bit, it's true that democracy has not been a ballot box issue here in the past few elections. I will remind you that the 2011 election campaign was prompted by an unprecedented case of contempt of parliament uh, which was followed by a campaign in which the Prime Minister took five questions a day behind a rope barrier um, and talking <clears> up <throat> coalitions as dangerous and got a majority government. Uh, democracy was not a pressing issue in 2011. Just a few weeks ago here at the Politics and the Pen dinner in Ottawa, Joseph Heath's book, Enlightenment 2.0, won the Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for political books. The book, uh, which I also recommend is a call for reason to return uh, reason to return to politics and when he gave his acceptance speech Heath made gr a reference to the growing body of literature in Canada on the erosion of democracy. He said these books are proof that the left in Canada can write books but perhaps maybe they should turn their the contents of their brains into a strategy for winning elections. <laughs> So with that uh, challenge from Mr. Heath and, and the recognition that it's one thing to catalog the problem, but it's another thing to do something about it, we're going to go and, uh, to our panel now and talk about not just what's wrong with Canada, but what, can, what are the suggestions about fixing it. So Mark. Um, I think it's kind of a lot to ask writers to not only <laughs> write books, but plan campaigns. Go on. I mean, if we're going to be that far, I might as well just throw my hat into the ring right now. The, um, it reminds me of an old joke about, um, about the Pope, where uh, it was raining and raining and raining, and, um, and the, the Vatican started to flood, and uh, these guys came by in a, in a boat, and they said to the, yelled into the Vatican, um, Pope, we've got to save you. We've got to get in the boat. And the Pope said, no, I put my faith in the hands of the Lord. And as the water got higher, uh, these you know, guys in a helicopter came by the Vatican and said, Pope, Pope, you've got to come with us. The flood is about to cover you. And he said, no, I put my faith in the hands of the Lord. They kept ringing and the Pope drowned and the Pope got to heaven and and the Pope said to uh, God, why didn't you help me? And he said, I, uh, I put my faith in your hands. And God said, I sent a boat and a helicopter. I don't know what more you wanted me to do. <laughs> anyway, there's this feeling in Canada right now uh, among the left and among the uh, political writers in this country and um, opposition people, and I think and, and, and among conscientious progressive conservatives and even um, the original sort of core of the Reform Party who had a sort of a 
uh, a, a libertarian, <laughs> democratic aspect to them that I find sometimes quite pleasing, um, that the worst of this government uh, is, is just sort of uh, some affectation of, of power in Ottawa and that, um, that when these guys are gone, um, all of the sort of unpleasantness of them will go with them. Um, for one thing, I don't think they're planning to leave anytime soon. And uh, uh, I also think that the things that they're doing are now being so entrenched into our system uh, like a sort of fibrous tumor. Uh, that uh, it will take many, many years to extricate this stuff if any new government wants to. And I think what's happened is that a process that began a long time ago and has been going on quite slowly since the end of the Second World War has been hugely accelerated um, since, since Harper came to power. And uh, it makes it very easy for the core central group of the clique that ends up running the prime minister's office to run the country. And it will take almost a superhuman discipline for the next clique that runs the country through the PMO to undo this, to, to shed this, this, this kind of power. And it'll be very easy for those people to rationalize not doing it. Um, and I've seen a lot of opposition parties over the years who sound very good about democratic reform, everything from proportional representation uh, to uh, you know making a tip work better to whatever, um, real you know come into power and say, oh well you know uh, it's too tough now the discipline of power that sort of thing. I think the work of people like you is to make sure that the people who run really believe in the stuff they say. We become a country, and I think this is what, uh, what Mr. Heath's book uh, really nails, a country that runs on total bullshit. <laughs> um, we, we, we live, we use bullshit like plants use sunlight to uh, photosynthesize food. And we have to stop doing that. We have to actually get back to rational reason thought and even if we take it, it on the chin, or it's a little harder to deal with reality instead of bullshit, we have to do that. Because if we don't, the fantasy land that we live in will become a sort of weird reality. Um, and I, that, the, the point I tried to make in the book that I wrote was that the story of Canada itself is core to us. Uh, and, and what Harper has done by controlling information and also by very skilled propaganda uh, is to change the way we think about ourselves and feel about our country and the way we feel about each other. And these are not just sort of political things that can be fixed by acts of parliament, but they, they're, they're ways that we are going to have to look at, at how we, we interact uh, on a class basis, on gender basis, on a whole bunch of things that we thought we had fixed that are being unfixed very, very quickly by this government. Um, it's going to be a very tough election. Uh, I'm not sure Harper's going to lose this election. In fact, I, I'm quite sure he has a very good chance of winning it. And, um, and, but I think we have to have this conversation. We, we have had an aborted version of it a few times. Um, there was the talk of a democratic deficit uh, before the 2005-06 election, and we need to get back to that again. It's, a, uh, it's important that we, res that we either take back democracy in this country or we, we're just losing it. Thank you. Um, I just want to start out by saying that uh, he, may, he may win the next election because they've cheated in all three. So he may win again, and he's rigged the Fair Election Act that, so that it's going to be easier this time to cheat. And if there is one thing that Stephen Harper has taught all of us, it's to parse every word, to read every amendment, to look behind every correct piece of his rhetoric and see what he actually does. And Party of One was dedicated to the proposition that maybe Steve had an insight when he said, 
Don't listen to what a politician says. Look at what he does. And I spent a long time in that book looking at exactly what he did. And two things jump out. Stephen Harper isn't interested in the truth. There are many, many examples of that. Nor is he interested in any form of accountability. And his favorite weapon um, is fear. A lot of people are afraid. I've never written a book where people haven't been afraid to talk to me. <laughs> Trust me. When uh, we were criticizing the Roman Catholic Church at the time of Mal Cashel, because it was a lay order of the Roman Catholic Church that was responsible for what happened at that orphanage to 91 kids under the age of 10, uh, there was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of hatred in the air, and there was a lot of fear in talking to the guy at the Sunday Express with me because I was saying the words. But to me, words are sacred. Words have meaning. So when I did my interview with Preston Manning, the most interesting insight he gave me was words don't mean anything to Stephen. And this was not coming from a colleague in the business who may or may not like the conservatives. This was coming from Stephen Harper's mentor, who hired him as he stepped out of university. And his view of Stephen is he would say anything as long as it had the desired effect. And as I did the research for Party of One, I discovered that the communications theory told to me time after time by the boys in short pants was that he told his people, we don't care about the truth. His handlers and senior people in the CPC party told those people, we care about the perception. Michael Sona told me that for the record over and over again. His job was to create the right impression. And um, if you start looking at what a democracy actually is, John F. Kennedy said an interesting thing when I was a kid that moved me. He said, in a democracy, you always have to tell the people the truth. And of course, the reason you do is they will judge, they will exercise their franchise based on knowing what their government is doing on their behalf. And if they never find out, democracy fails at a fundamental level. With Stephen Harper, trust me, you never find out. One, one small example, uh, cabinet directives um, are made available to the Auditor General, but the drafts of those cabinet directives are never made available. And that means that the reasons for the decision are forever secret, like so much with this government. The first thing this guy wanted to do with Sheila Fraser was to make everything a cabinet confidentiality, which would have meant she would have had nothing to work with. The Treasury Board Secretariat went to her and said, we want to be exempt, just as the people in national security issues are exempt. And you go down that line. One of the most amazing interviews I did for the book was with Robert Marlowe. You may re remember him because he was the guy that was sent in as privacy commissioner uh, in the wake of the Radwanski mess and he dealt with that problem. Stephen Harper recruited and hired him. At the end of the day, Stephen Harper's own commissioner, his own information commissioner said that Harper had become an enemy of uh, freedom of information, had done nothing about accountability, and in fact, the last thing he said to me was, you know, Stephen Harper, having attained absolute power, has abused it, absolutely, which is something you cannot do in a democracy. So to go back to the first point that Susan raised about what to do and Mark commented on, there's nothing wrong with us that the best part of what Canada has to offer can't fix, but it starts in the room and it starts with people. It's not in the hands of the spinners and the politicians and all of the people that get paid uh, to turn language into a fouled stream. It's in our hands. And I think that when we get to the point where we have 60% of the people voting, we've got a lot of room to grow to be better citizens, and that's where I think the solution is. Get out there and vote. Yeah. Frederick? Uh, thank you. I'm a, um, I'm a political scientist, and I'm also the director of the Center for International yes. Studies. No, no, I'm just uh, cor correcting you. I'm just um, saying that I know more about democracy outside Canada than I do about democracy in Canada, and especially about democracy in Europe. But I think Europe is a useful point of comparison when trying to understand uh, the erosion of democracy. Uh, you know, two main things we observed 
uh, in Canada and outside. One is the centralization of power in uh, the Prime Minister's office or in the hands of the executive. And the second is the fact that parliamentary debates have become irrelevant and oftentimes disgraceful because they are uh, ir irrelevant. I think this is happening in Canada. I mean, the current government may have taken this quite far, um, but this is happening everywhere in all Western democracies. Just two examples. Um, President Obama uh, often governs by executive order, and as progressives, uh, we like that, the fact that he, you know, uh, he governs this way. Uh, in France, recently, the socialist government has passed its budget using an article of the Constitution called 49.3, which allows the government to pass the budget without a vote in the House. So this is not something that is limited to the right, and it's not something that's limited to Canada. It's happening in a lot of places. Uh, why? That's the question. I think we have to understand that the crisis of representation is, is broader uh, than, than, than the past few years may have told us. Um, the idea that you know, representation takes place in parliamentary debates has been gone for a long time, uh, perhaps even 100 years, some would argue. And over the past 30 years, what's happened is also that the idea that parties are where you know, the legitimacy is, is also gone. And you see that party loyalty is gone, people don't trust political parties, and they don't trust um, parliament. This is what gives someone like Stephen Harper so much room for maneuver. This is what allows him to do all the things that uh, my co-panelists have described, because a growing number of people don't actually think parliament or parties should be where democracy is take, taking place uh, either. So there's a generalized uh, lack of trust that I think we need to understand uh, if we want to understand the erosion of democracy. Now, uh, institutional reforms are certainly a, a good thing. Um, for example, I think Kelly will talk about uh, proportional representation. We know that you know it's, it makes the executive less powerful. In most European countries, you have proportional representation or a consensus democracy. Uh, it makes the parties more powerful too. Uh, it may, you know, it's associated to all kinds of good things. For example, more women in parliament, um, you know, <laughs> lots of things we, we would want. But it's not a miracle cure. Institutional reform is not a miracle cure uh, either. Uh, just to give you one example, in all countries in Europe that have a stronger parliament and stronger parties, we do observe a much stronger extreme right. I mean, Charles Taylor talked about it this morning. All of continental European countries have a very, very strong uh, populist, radical right uh, party, often in government. And they get 20, 25, 30% of the seats precisely because uh, they have a system that's different um, than, than ours. So in some ways, I mean, we could say we're lucky in some respects, even uh, if we have to accept um, that the executive is, is, is too strong. In terms of solution, uh, solutions, um, there's only one country that has really enacted institutional reform in the, about democracy in the past few years, and that's Iceland. So interesting to, case to look at, but it's a very small place. So not sure the comparison is, is, is really all that useful. <clears throat> I think uh, we have to come to terms with the fact, we have to get used to the fact that the executive is where the power is going to be for uh, the next decade, not only in Canada, everywhere. This means that leaders matter more than before. If you look at, again, Europe, people like Merkel or Matteo Renzi in Italy, who are uh, very uh, powerful figures, uh, rule not because they run a party or because their parties are in good shape. They rule because of who they are. Uh, that doesn't mean, and actually I think what it means, and I'm going back to what was uh, said, it means that personal, uh, personality really matters in a way, and, and ethics matters, uh, individual ethics, so not just uh, institutions. Personal responsibility uh, or irresponsibility is also part of the erosion that we're witnessing in a lot of countries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kelly. Thanks. My piece is to talk about the reform for Canada and I just want to open by thanking the Broadbent Institute for elevating this issue on this panel and especially Ed Broadbent who has been a very long time champion of electoral reform in this country. So I guess the question for me is about democracy and when I say democracy to you, does it mean we the people, for the people, by the people? 
or does it mean a court government that, uh, where the effective power resides in the prime minister and his courtiers, or as Michael referred to them as the boys in short pants? And I think that kind of frames up the discussion about what we want to talk about. Um, Fair Vote Canada is a multi-partisan campaign to change the electoral system here in Canada to proportional representation. You know, it's do we support top-down government or do we want a government that is by the people for the people? There have been 10 studies, commissions and assemblies now in Canada that have asked Canadians what they want around electoral reform and every single one of them has suggested that we move to a system of proportional representation to help us move forward. Um, and poll after poll that goes out to Canadians asking them about electoral reform comes back that almost 80% of Canadians support a system of proportional representation. There are two types of electoral systems in the world. There are majoritarian systems, which we call winner-take-all systems, first past the post, the alternative vote. So countries like Canada, the UK, Australia, United States, and France all exist under these um, systems. And winner-take-all systems have a basic flaw. They have a high percentage of wasted votes, and I'll tell you what that is in, in just a moment. Uh, distorted overall results, which the seats uh, voted for are not the seats that, they, that a party earns, uh, as we know in this country. There's a suppression of minority viewpoints, adversarial politics, and legislatures that do not accu accurately represent the diversity of, the country, of a country. On the other side of that, you have proportional systems, which um, political scientist Aaron Liebhart describes as a kinder, gentler democracy that's built on cooperation and consensus. Um, and the PR systems are guided by a principle that the number of votes a party receives reflects the number of seats that they get. Not if you get 39% of the vote, you get 39% of the seats, not 54% of the seats and 100% of the power. You get what the voters told you they wanted. Um, and we know that proportional representation countries tend to produce legislatures which better reflect the diversity views of a country. So I'm going to throw out some numbers to you, and some of these numbers I find very shocking, um, and I hope you do too. <laughs> 24 million eligible voters in this country. In 2011, only 14 million 800 people went to the polls. Nine million people stayed home. Out of the people who voted, half of those voters, seven million voters, did not, were not able to elect a representative. And 39% of the voters gave one party 54% of the seats and 100% of the power, which effectively put 61% of the voters, the majority, on the sidelines. And I have to hand it to the official opposition, you know, holding this government's feet to the fire. But the reality is, Stephen Harper can do whatever he wants, as we've seen. And sometimes people like to frame proportional representation in North America as some type of <coughs> radical choice. 85% of OECD countries use some form of proportional representation. We are the laggards here, <laughs> I have to say. And the research is clear around proportional representation. Countries with PR elect 8% more women. Now, that's really significant here in Canada because we hover around 24, 25%. That would put us above the UN um, sanction threshold for democracy deficit for women and would give us a critical mass of women's voices in our government to work on women's issues. Voter turnout is about 8% higher and countries that are built on, on uh, policy built on cooperation and consensus have stronger environmental policies because they're more reflective of the views of voters. 
And because proportional representation relies on consensus and cooperation, it provides a mechanism to limit abuses and concentrations of power. And this is my own personal viewpoint, but I believe that if we had proportional representation in 2011, we would not have gutted our environmental oversight. Our lakes and rivers would still have protections on them. Perhaps we wouldn't have signed a 30-year deal with China that entrenches investor state protections. We wouldn't be silencing scientists, stifling debate, or defunding women's groups. So, Canadians vote for diversity and we have a diverse country and we're stuck with a system that, that stifles diversity and it's, it's uh, undemocratic and it's patronizing. But we have a real chance to change things here in Canada. We have uh, the official opposition and the Green Party have both signed on to make electoral reform, proportional representation specifically, part of their election planks in 2015. And in December, uh, electoral reform critic um, Craig Scott for the NDP put in a motion uh, through the House asking for mixed member proportional representation, which is the model that the NDP supports. All of the NDPs voted for it, all of the blocs, all of the Greens, um, and half of the Liberal caucus voted in favour of proportional representation. There is very strong support for PR in the grassroots of the Liberal Party. So we will need 170 votes going into the next election to bring in proportional representation. And so our campaign is going out to every single candidate and we're going to ask them the questions, we're going to educate them on PR, and we're going to make sure that we have those 170 votes going forward. And just to, to say, you know, Ferdi mentioned that, you know, it's not the panacea to democracy, and I would agree with that. But what it does is it levels the playing field and changes the dynamic of government to make every vote count. And it changes two basic things that are basic to democracy. That everyone has the right to representation in their country and that the majority has the right to make the decisions. And the decisions that we will make will be up to us, the majority. So I encourage everybody to go out and take a look at this campaign and get involved with it in the grassroots so that we can make 2015 the last unfair election. Thank you all, and especially thank you for uh, democratically keeping the, uh, the field open for lots of questions and lots of conversation. Um, I'm going to kick it off, but, um, but please start thinking of anything you'd like to ask. Uh, we'd be happy to have questions. Um, one of the things, I'll start it off with, it came up in, in a couple of your remarks, was that there's an air of inevitability about this. That that whether this is part of some global trend or whether it's, you know, the people who, uh, who play this way win elections. And as Mark said, if once it's gone, do we think that it can ever come back? Um, I'd like to get your views on whether democracy and the ailments it now has, is it a, is it a fixable condition? Yeah. Definitely. Um, it's a matter of public will. Uh, politicians understand money and they understand votes. The, those, are the, those are the two currencies. That's, that's all there are. And if uh, they believe that people really are, you know, that this is a core issue for people, they will do something about it. Um, <clears throat> I think we have, uh, I mean, I, I know we all sort of sounded like a bit of a bummer, but there are people working very hard and we do have sort of rear guard actions especially among the bar in this country and the courts in this country uh, to maintain um, the structure and integrity of democratic institutions as much as possible. The thing that, that can be done, that can be fixed easily by a new government is to strengthen the power of watchdogs in our system. And it was something that the professor um, 
didn't really deal with, and I hope he does, uh, because we, we have built checks and balances into the Canadian system that are quite different from the ones uh, in other countries where you know, there's the courts, the legislature, the executive. We actually build checks and balances within our actual bureaucracy and our executive system to prevent our executive from getting out of control, uh, with spending out of control. Those are the watchdogs that I talk about in my book that Harper's gone after. Now we can fix those really easily with a new government. Uh, we can do things like uh, attach CERC to the House of Commons we, and make more of these, uh, these uh, watchdogs, parliamentary budget officers with guaranteed budgets forever. Uh, we can do things like hiring uh, professional counsel for committees so that we have a system like the Americans where each major committee has its own lawyers and its own researchers who are pretty much untouchable so that parliamentary committees are stronger. Um, there are, uh, if we can do that, then no matter what the instinct is of the people who get elected, there, there will be those um, those checks uh, there in the system. Michael. Susan, I just have um, a very brief comment because I want to hear from people. But um, it really comes down in part to what Donald Gutstein has said in his book, uh, and that is that the whole thing that put Harper in power has been on the go for 30 or 40 years. Uh, think tanks have become fact factories, and uh, the word liberal or union, for example, have become terrible phrases. Uh, as the word liberal in the United States has been vilified by the right. Uh, and it seems to me that that's a big part of, of what we face, but it all goes back to the same issue. If the prime minister of the country doesn't have any respect for people like Linda Keene, and he doesn't have any respect for people like Munir Sheikh, he doesn't have any respect for Kevin Page, why would you expect he would have it for you? And I think... One of, the things, one of the things we have to do is to realize when a person has no respect for the traditions of parliament or parliamentary officers, what that person, and he centralizes power, as the professor was saying, in the prime minister's office, which is a feature of a lot of governments around the world, every time he takes more power for himself, he diminishes the MP that represents you. And that's the catch. The more power that goes to the Prime Minister, the less important becomes the MP until finally he's just a wind-up toy. And although other people have centralized power in the Prime Minister's office, uh, we had both Robert Marlowe and um, uh, Speaker Milliken, longest speaker and longest standing speaker in the Canadian Parliament, Dean of Speakers around the world, make the point this guy is the all time democracy killer when it comes to centralizing power. And one of the things we've got to do is distribute that power back to where it should have been in the first place, which is with members of Parliament. Novel idea. <laughs> I think there, there is a, a structural trend towards centralization in the hands of, of the executive. We, we have to recognize that. I mean, it's, it's, there's no, no way we can hide uh, that. However, that doesn't mean you have to behave in a non-civil way when you're in power. I mean, there are different individuals who would behave differently. So I think that's where the differences can be observed between different countries as we speak. About the lack of, uh, certainly Canada is not a country that's known for its checks and balances. It never has been, and that's part of being a monarchy, I guess. Um, there is one uh, way in which power is shared, and that's the fact that we haven't talked about it, but it's a federation. So in you know, com comparison to other countries, the fact that you still have your province, which is not necessarily uh, the same government as the federal level, does make a difference in comparison to other countries, I would say. Well, I think you know that I, I believe that we, we certainly can change the system, and it's always been people that have changed the system. And I think that, you know, light bulbs are coming on across this country, across, across the globe, and people are mobilizing. And I think it's actually very hopeful. And it's not until you realize that there's a crisis do people, you know, get out of their seats and start doing something about it. And I think about the car industry and all of the safety and regulations we have around vehicles, well, all of those happened because of, you know, 
accidents that happen or you know a call to action it wasn't because somebody said oh I think maybe we just need seat belts right so I think that people are recognizing that we have a crisis in our democracy and they're getting up and we're looking for solutions and it will be the people that change the system Okay, we have about 15 minutes left, the time has flown. Um, so we're gonna go to questions from the floor. And I, is that Ian Waddell I see down there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll start there and then uh, back and forth. Thanks, thanks Susan, my name is Ian Waddell. I had the privilege <laughs> of serving for 10 years in a caucus whose leader didn't treat us like uh, wound up toys, Michael. His name was Ed Broadbent. <laughs> But, but right now, I'm producing a, a film called Why Young People Don't Vote. It's made by uh, people all under 30. It's going to be broadcast for an hour on CPAC and on TV Ontario with Steve Paik and this fall. Um, and uh, only one-third of that uh, millennium generation is voting. Uh, and according to, a, I think, a broadband uh, report yesterday, just released yesterday saying that the young people tend to be a progressive generation and that's what I found out in talking to them. Uh, if they voted in the percentage that we vote, they could change the government of Canada in October. So I want to ask this question to the panelists. Could you answer in one or two sentences? If you were talking to these young people, to these millennials under 34, uh, about why they should vote, what would you say to them? I, I, One actually, or two sentences, too. <laughs> I, do, I do talk to them because I go to school with them. Uh, Pardon me? <laughs> and uh, they would vote if they hear the things that matter to them. Thanks. Thanks. I would simply say to everybody of that age group, uh, if you don't take an interest in politics, Politics will take an interest in you. You may not like the result. <laughs> I'm going to be extremely boring, but um, people vote if their friends vote. So it's really a matter of group pressure in general. That's, that's not boring at all, actually. Yeah, I would say that too. Uh, Elections Canada tells us that the first time somebody votes, that they'll vote for life. But I think you ha we also have to look at the system where elections are decided in swing ridings, right? So the issues that matter to young people aren't being talked about, and so I think that's a, a big problem that we have right now. Okay, we'll uh, go over to the other side there, the mic. Sorry, Hello. I can't see that far. That's so. okay, that's okay. My name is Emmanuel Tremblay, and I'm the very newly elected uh, president of the Canadian Association of Professional Employees. Thank you. Uh, CAPE is the union that represents Library of Parliament analysts. So you were talking about long-term analytical power. That supposedly exists, if only they respected it. Uh, I also represent EC, so statisticians. You know all the drill. And, and since I've been president of CAPE, I've met in 30 meetings, like three, in three months, I'd ha I had 30 to 35, 40 meetings with my members. And what I tell them is that we have to stop feeling ashamed of being public servants. And this government... <clears throat> and we have to just start telling the truth to our anti-union brother-in-law that says, oh, I can't believe my taxes pay for your sick leave and I don't even have sick leave, you know? This is all a load of rubbish. And if we lose our sick leave as public servants, the rest of Canada will have no hope in hell of ever getting it. So we have to start regaining confidence in the fact that we are actually the embodiment of the Westminster model and the pillar of democracy. And I find myself in a position of being a big union boss, right? And the role that I see for myself is one of a, a rempart de la démocratie, right? So I think this is the kind of discourse that all unions should have with their rank and file members and just encourage people to vote and encourage other people to vote, their kids to vote, because the young generation is going to be central in the next election. And I would see the female vote is gonna be central in the next election. This government is anti-women. They have terrible, terrible
fiscal policies that are completely retrograde, retrograde. I mean, we are not in the 50s, and income splitting is all about putting women back in their place. We have to stand up to this bully government, and we have to start building confidence again. Sorry, it wasn't a question. It was kind of more of a comment. Okay. Thank you. In deference to other people who want to ask questions, though, can we can we try to make sure they are questions? Um, we, we do want to get through. Uh, we've got four people at the mics now, and less than ten minutes. So, I, I was never any good at math, but uh, I'm hoping the others are. are. So let's start here. Hi, um, my name is Sandy Wolofsky. I'm just your average Canadian who's here. Just, um, just, <laughs> just a simple Canadian, Canadian who votes. <laughs> um, I really wanted to ask a question in terms of democracy as a whole, vis-a-vis uh, -vis proportional, um, proportional representation, and ask a further question along with it, and in terms of term limits. And my question is, you know, would term limits force elected officials to become less entrenched in being re-elected and more apt to do what is better for society? Or will they not have been there long enough to achieve anything? It's a question I often ask, and I'm wondering if all you experts up there could answer it. And if it flows in one way, is this something that the fair vote people should be talking about also? I'll just say to kick that off, you should have a look at the Senate debates over term limits. The, the people who are in the Senate, um, I know Senate's not a popular thing right now, but a lot of the people in the Senate when they were debating this had some really interesting things to say about the two sides of that. But uh, any others have views on? I We'll let Kelly start. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's not something that we talk about term limits in, in respect to proportional representation. <clears throat> the limits that we have right now would probably stay the same. So it's an interesting question. Um, the reason I ask this is yeah. if proportional representation goes through yeah. and you actually elect people who really care about something yeah. and you keep them there for only a limit, a, a term or two, are they more apt to stick with their ideologies and actually accomplish something and then they move okay. on to something else in life and they haven't been corrupted? Or are they not there long enough to actually achieve anything, they haven't learned the system. It's, it's a question I have, I've thought about yeah. it a lot, I don't know where to go. So there's a dynamic with proportional representation. Right now, uh, under our current system, we have single member ridings. In proportional representation, you would have multi-member districts, and what that does is it changes the dynamic on the ground and makes MPs more competitive for uh, voters' attention and more aware of voters' issues. And I think that's something that um, is really helpful in terms of that. Term limits, as I said, we, we haven't really explored um, that issue, but I think that's where the dedication comes from probably is in the grassroots around the structure uh, in the region. Thank you. Um, we're hearing, obviously, there's a lot, sorry, I'm losing my voice after this weekend, uh, a lot of different elements at play in trying to improve democracy. And one of the things that I, uh, there hasn't seemed to be much conversation about in Canada, and I'm curious of your opinions on, is mandatory voting. Um, I know that Oregon just uh, passed a law requiring p anybody with a driver's license essentially to be a registered voter. And I'm just curious, um, I mean, obviously we would need a government to get elected to actually implement that, and it seems we're far away from that, but I'm curious your thoughts on how effective that would be. Okay, can the, the question and next question behind and then that'll be... I just wanted to ask a question about the role of campaign financing because you said uh, that even in PR systems that the right still gets ahead and so partly we know the right is representing the wealthy and the people with the money and the establishment and so maybe if we could control campaign financing that might eliminate that bias. Okay, in the remaining three minutes, um, I'm just going to ask the panelists to either address uh, anthems, um, uh, mandatory voting or campaign finance, and just say some, some uh, final words. I got a quick, a quick comment on campaign financing. Um, Arthur Finkelstein, who is the uh, US Republican consultant who is behind Stephen Harper and has been a mentor for a long time, says that money matters a great deal in politics because money 
determines who gets hurt. And that's what it comes down to. So I think we need to control it and remember what Stephen Harper did on this issue. He went to the Supreme Court of Canada to ask for unlimited third party spending in elections, just as they have in the United States. That's something we can never allow to happen here. Um, I guess I'll just uh, pick up the other question, which is a, a quite a good question of mandatory voting. Uh, I have a very contrarian view on it. I think we have to earn votes. Uh, if we make people vote, um, we're basically forcing people who are actually say, trying to tell us something by not voting uh, to say something else to us. If people aren't voting, it's not because they're lazy or they're stupid or they don't care or their friends don't make them. I don't believe that. I think people don't vote because they choose not to vote, if that makes any sense. They choose, and I think they choose not to vote because they are they're not hearing something from the system. So I think the job of people here is to connect with them, not shotgun them into voting. We'll go Kelly first and then Frederick and then we're uh, done. Uh, yeah, I'll just add on to that mandatory voting. I think right now having seven million votes where people can't even elect a representative, I think we need to give people a, a reason to vote first and then if they don't go to the polls, maybe think about whacking them over the head. But I think you really have to give people a reason to vote first. And Frederick. Okay, two things. First of all, uh, I think you know, we should not forget that it's still a democracy that by international standards is not so bad. I mean, it's not Scandinavia, but if you look at all the objective indicators, we're not, you know, in the worst possible position ever. And the reason why the Conservatives win has a lot to do with what was mentioned, but also with something that I don't need to remind NDP voters of, which is that the progressives are divided. And in the system, as long as we have the system that Kelly has described, um, you know, you can do a lot of you can mobilize the, the, the people and the youth and everything, but uh, there's still a very high chance that the Conservatives will win the election. Well, on that um, predictive note, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to thank all the panelists. I learned some stuff. I hope, uh, I hope everybody here did as well. And if nothing else, I hope it uh, encourages people to go out and uh, tell people to vote and participate because that's... Uh, for whatever party, because uh, that's sort of what this is all about. Thank you for your time and thank you for your thank talk. You. Thank you so much.